is on. Is on. Okay, uh, just for Scott, when you talk about the ARC and the different ones, one of the issues we have in a lot of places in the same areas is what about broadband or communications with that? We got a broadband guy uh, because, and I actually work with him quite a bit. It, it, it all goes to that factor of isolation that we talked about. And uh, if, you are, if you face broadband isolation, it's no different than transportation isolation. So that I think there is a recognition, especially kind of in rural America, which is much of the region uh, that I've been working in, uh, that that is important as well, and that we have a huge emphasis on that. And so later on, come and grab me, and I'll give you our broadband guy. Mark DeFalco is his name, and they run all sorts of programs to try to address that very issue. Very important. We used to, I guess we still do, have a surplus of containers at the coastal ports, but I've heard that some of the inland ports don't have surpluses, and so they don't get the advantage of that cheap backhaul. Can anybody speak to that? Is that common? Who's willing to talk first? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a pain in the neck. Um, as you would imagine, you've got containers coming in and you've got containers going out. Uh, a lot depends on what the commodities are, what ports they're coming through, where they're going, but trying to sustain a balance of having enough containers positioned everywhere to meet demand has always been a pain in the neck for the industry. My guess is it always will. There are people constantly struggling to try to figure out how to better sort that out so that those kinds of problems don't exist as bad, but it's just a function of the world we live in. My guess is it will always be a challenge, but there's a lot of attention that goes to it. Anyone else want to? Yeah. I just want to add one thing, that a lot of the owners of the containers have really been pretty hard-nosed about concentrating them in certain inland ports, that some cities have been left out of shipments because they said, once we get a container there, it's never going to come back. So uh, they're, the, they're trying to concentrate in you know, Chicago, Memphis, Kansas City, et cetera. This question is for Rocky. Uh, heard not long ago that uh, comment made about the Chinese government that the Chinese economy was going so fast and such, you know, rising so fast in steps that the Chinese government were kind of taking steps to slow the economy down. Have you heard anything or got any info on that? Yeah, there, there were, uh, and I showed a slide showing the run up in debt um, by the uh, private non-financial sector. Um, because of concerns of how debt heavy uh, the sector was going, they put in more constraints on that. Uh, when you look at the Chinese economy in general, it's been an investment driven uh, economy. That is what has you know fueled all of this expansion. Um, and they are now trying to transition uh, to a more diversified economy uh, based on domestic consumption. Um, and that's going to be a challenge for them. And so they are taking steps of getting away from investment, uh, the, you know, deflating that bubble of debt um, to slow it down, to make it more sustainable. Um, that's the big debate among, you know, people looking at China, economists. Uh, when you look at it and you compare it to other economies, there's a lot of factors that are you know, flashing red lights saying there could be a very severe downturn, that you are due for a recession. On the other side of that, China hasn't had a recession for over 20 years, and they have been successfully navigating that. And so you know, that, that's where we're at. Um, that's why, you know, from a business planning standpoint, we think it's prudent to assume a um, managed slowdown in the growth of their economy, but you have to factor in some risk for a sharper downturn. Um, you can let Rocky keep okay. that. Um, I have a question. Um, Hong Kong and China, one acting as one country, two different principles. 
Um, the statistical data that you showed for China and the growth in the imports, how much of that data is truly includes the Hong Kong, which is considered, you know, they're considered, they're two countries, but they act, operate under one principle of that particular country governed under China. Yeah, so for most of the statistics uh, there, I was taking China as whole, which includes uh, Hong Kong and some of the other provence, uh, provinces. All right, isn't it up, uh, there's one in the back, and then we got another one up front after that, David. Just uh, one more question for Rocky. Uh, you mentioned, I think, near the end of your presentation uh, in regards to Southern Pine, the, uh, I guess, an expectation that log prices or stumpage log prices would not rise. And of course, we deal a lot with landowners, and, sure. and that's, that's not a happy thing for them. Yeah. I just wondered if you had any comments, further comments about that. Yeah. And, and I, I want to clarify, you know, I didn't say they wouldn't rise, uh, but we're not looking for a sharp uh, increase in pricing. Uh, we're not looking uh, in the near term, near term being over the next five years to come anywhere close to the price levels we were in the mid 2000s. Uh, when we look at the uh, expected underlying demand uh, for forest products, we look at the south meaning meeting a greater share of that increased demand because of supply constraints in other producing regions. We look at the increase in uh, converting capacity uh, that has um, been planned and is in process of being built across the south. We do see stronger demand coming uh, that will help uh, close that gap between growth on the softwood resource and demand. With that being said, inventory levels are going to continue to be elevated relative to where they were in the mid uh, 2000s. Uh, we do see when the drain on the resource at least uh, meets growth and ends the expansion in the resource, more strength coming to prices. But relative to the mo product markets of a decade ago, uh, they're going to be much more uh, modest. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, we're seeing a lot of requests for quotes uh, compare Vietnam versus China, and we've heard anecdotally that a lot of the Chinese operators are moving to Vietnam or setting up satellite locations to get around the fumigation issues, tariff issues, et cetera, and then they're moving those from other ports, not necessarily always Vietnam, but into China. Is that a trend that you see continuing, or is that you've heard about, or is this just a one-off that we've kind of run across? Um, and, you know, I, I've heard anecdotally similar. Um, I think that when you look at some of the uh, um, planning that's going into the Belt Road Initiative about, you know, distributing um, supply chains across a number of different geographies and countries, um, I, I think that uh, from China's perspective, that's something that will likely to continue. Um, with the duty implementation, how do you foresee the container availability in the U.S. ports? Because we, we talked about earlier a little bit about backhauls from China, and how is that going to influence our the availability of containers? I, I don't look at containers specifically, but I, I think with the duties going on on both sides, I mean, you're looking for a downturn in uh, trade between the two countries, so I would expect... Uh, lower, but I'm sure someone else can. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it was interesting when I was listening to you talk and, and everyone, and, and really all of the presenters here today. I mean, what you find is there are so many factors affecting what we do, uh, especially when you look into the international marketplace. There are bubbles floating around all over the place. The bubble of the moment, you know, is the, uh, the trade war between the United States and China. But, you know, I, I promise you six months from now, there'll be another bubble. And so I think what that, what that tells you is that you do the best as you can to get through those bubbles when they happen. But if you really want to protect yourself, you remain diversified. Because as China comes down or not, you know, someone else will be moving up. And so that if you can inject yourself into a diversified marketplace all over the world, you can ride those bubbles, okay? And, and they have always been there and they will always be there. 
The key is to stay close to it and adjust and be able to adjust the markets that are best for you depending on what the commodity is. In this place, it's wood products and stuff. So stay, be able to react quickly as the marketplace changes. Any other any guys want to say anything? Okay. Who's next? We got more questions than that, surely. I got one. So for you uh, logistics guys specifically, we talked about auto truck driving and automated. What You said that's fu future down the road. What do you see as more near as far as innovation and, and changes in moving containers specifically? I'll take a shot at that and invite anybody else to comment. I think what we're seeing in the nearer term, I would describe as driver assist, not driver eliminate. Uh, another thing you might see is in very dense traffic lanes, you might see an autonomous train, if you will, of trucks operating between uh, an, a, uh, a seaport, maybe Charleston and Atlanta. So I think it will evolve over time and we won't see a big bang all of a sudden, all the drivers are eliminated. Other comments? Yeah, yeah I know here, here in Tennessee, uh, TDOT has been working to develop a pilot program for platooning of trucks. And they've changed the, uh, the law so that that is permitted. So I think you're going to see that kind of platooning kind of activity like, that, like, like he mentioned and uh, going from there. Who's got more questions? Anybody? So oh, we got one right here, David, in the suit jacket. Thanks. Um, you touched touch base a little bit on the Indian market and you mentioned growth in population. I'm wondering about um, thinking of the example in China, the growth of the middle class in China and what, what are the main drivers of the economic growth going on there and how you foresee that's going to impact um, their demand for forest products. <clears throat> so specifically to China and that growth of the middle class and, and, and that's what we're um, seeing um, shift uh, on their consumption side. We just did a study uh, looking specifically of the changing trends of wood consumption. Um, you know, when we uh, saw the first, uh, when we first saw the run up in demand uh, in China really starting in 2010 and on uh, from North America, a lot of that wood was being used um, for concrete forming uh, to, to um, facilitate that big explosion in construction they've had. Uh, with this emerging middle class, what we're starting to see uh, is uh, more consumption for consumer goods domestically. Um, I was at the border uh, of China and Russia earlier this year. We saw a lot of beautiful lumber and logs coming across the border at the land uh, ports there. They have these huge facilities um, developed for processing uh, the wood products. Um, and he's, I, I never thought I would see so many bed slats being sawn um, because there is this growing demand uh, for furniture because you have a wealthier middle class emerging. And so when we look at some of those shifts, um, and that, you know, that, that's what we see occurring. When we think about that in terms of you know, winners and losers from a supply standpoint, um, you know, Russia, as I, I spoke about, uh, is looking to take advantage of that. And there's also a lot of utilization of radiata pine, chiefly from uh, New Zealand and some of the furniture markets. Comment, I, I was listening to this and I was thinking about an experience we had, is we had taken uh, the, the, the move in China to develop access to Russia and, uh, and Western Europe. Um, it's a good idea. Um, we uh, took a delegation of miners to Mongolia to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, because they've discovered all sorts of minerals, coal, everything. They're sitting on this powder keg in Mongolia, and they're trying to figure out how do we you know, take advantage of that. And so we were there with American miners, and we were talking to them, and they were, they were showing us they had these coal deposits, and they want to sell the coal to China, because so many people in China. And so they're mapping out where these locations are, and they said, now we've got to figure out how we move the coal from our locations in uh, Mongolia into China. So we're building new railroads to be able to move the coal on the railroad onto China. Well, okay, that makes sense. And then I asked the question, 
which was wonderful. There's a little problem there because the gauge of the railroad in Russia and Mongolia is different than the gauge of the railroad in China, which means when the train gets to the track, the tracks change. They can't move the train because they're two different gauges as far as distance between the rails. So I said, if you're, this is great, if you're going to build these new rail lines to move coal from Mongolia to China, what gauge are you going to build the railroads? And they said, oh, we're going to use broad gauge. And I said, but Chinese are, narrow, are standard gauge. So why are you building a railroad to move coal to China that's in the wrong gauge? I said, well, that will prevent the Chinese from ever using the railroad to come in and attack Mongolia. So there, there are problems with everything, and I found that one. Still today, no one trusts anyone on that, and so I want to see how we're going to handle that little gauge thing. So, <laughs> so, so a couple of points. One, just historical fact that I thought was fascinating. The, the change in gauge is actually related to the different chariot widths from you know, dating before railroad, and they would actually build the chariot widths differently so the, they, they couldn't run in the same troughs as, their, uh, as the other uh, clan or country uh, would. So that's where that all started developing way before even railroads. And so that's still uh, part of the strategy. In terms of the break gauge and some of the, you know, as the challenge is you're shipping material from Russia into China and you have this break gauge, what has happened in a couple of the key crossings, Manzoli and Suvenhe, is they're developing these huge industrial parks around the wood products. They bring in the primary processed uh, product, whether it's a cant or roughly sawn uh, timber or lumber, uh, crosses the border into China, and then they do value add there. They have, you know, in Manzoli, hundreds of dry kilns to dry the lumber so they can then move it at a lower weight into China. They have value add processing where they're making, you know, edge glued panels, finger jointed, um, treating uh, the lumber to move it with a higher value add into um, interior China and into the consuming centers. And so that's how they've sort of used that challenge of a, of a gauge break to add value to justify uh, shipping it along further. Any other questions in the crowd? Uh, we had a, a discussion earlier. We, you mentioned, Rocky, that India is going up as China might be coming down and where those meet, we don't know. But there are some questions in the crowd about India's internal infrastructure. Is that gonna hinder our ability to move product to a country like India? I think that's a great question, and I think that that is another reason why you can't look simply at population growth and say that's the next China, that you're going to see a repeat of the growth that we've seen uh, in China. Uh, I think that when you look uh, at that population growth, there is people making attempts to increase wood utilization there for residential construction, et cetera. So there are opportunities there, but there are a lot of um, unknowns uh, to figure out to where, you know, it's not a cookie cutter uh, approach uh, similar to what we've seen in China. Anybody else? I want to hit one last, Michael, you brought up export tech and you told us all about that. You gave us some numbers on projects you've had in, in states. Um, what are the criteria for a company working with you all and does it vary by state or is it standardized? Um, yes, it's, it's quite a bit different. We've had um, four sessions in Tennessee in, uh, since 2013 uh, and pl are planning one for next year. The criteria, uh, we have a, um, a go, no-go checklist, if you will. You um, have to be adequately financed, and we don't get into to, uh, a lot of private companies. We don't get into the real detail other than you have, you have a proven ability to be able to expand and to finance your expansion. In other words, it could be just an arrangement with a bank. Um, that you have a leadership team, typically the owner or CEO, who is actively engaged in the strategy development. 
Uh, we find that if you send someone, anyone, uh, who can't be a decision maker, then the program is not um, successful. Um, the difference uh, in, in uh, there is a wide disparity between the different states. Uh, 33 states actually have the program going on. Um, there is a charge of four companies that uh, participate in it, and the charge varies wildly from about $1,500 to about $8,000, depending on where you are. In the vast majority of cases, uh, companies are rebated. In other words, we ask for money up front so that you participate in the program, and then through a combination of step funds, through um, funding partners, uh, through federal government grants and state government grants, and FedEx and the U.S. Commercial Service, you typically are rebated almost everything uh, that you have invested in that. So we're looking for exporters that aren't expert. We're looking for small to medium-sized companies. We're looking for CEO involvement. And we're looking for the uh, interest in expanding outside of your particular area. Do we have any other questions before? We got one. Larry, you're right here. Uh, talking about trucking, you know, when you're going down the interstate, it seems like there's just multiple tractors and trailers. Are there any statistics on the number of vehicles, like 50% or so forth, of what its truckers are on the on our roadway systems? Yeah, well, there there are some statistics available, and of course, it varies by time of day and by highway. Uh, for those of us who you know travel between Memphis and Little Rock, it, it's over 50% trucks during certain times of the day. Same way going eastbound from Memphis towards Nashville, and it's uh, it's again it's, it's it's time of day dependent and it's facility dependent. More so, we have this east-west movement. What, what the reason why these numbers are so high is because, as I say, Memphis is one of the largest inland ports. And so what happens, these containers get dropped off in Memphis and then they're drayed, you know, the next 200 miles or so to Little Rock, uh, you know, to, to Nashville, to, to Jackson, uh, uh, Mississippi. So that's why you see so many um, trucks on the road is because anything less than 500 miles is probably a truck as far as a, a transportation shipment goes. And so that, that's what you're going to see. The, the nodes and the trucks emanating from those nodes. I got one more. The, as truck drivers are getting harder and harder to find, do you see the, the regulations to keep increasing on, you know, as far as hiring and so forth and the restrictions on the trucks? Yeah, good question. Uh, one of the things that's it's in front of Congress right now, and I forget the name of the act, is a, is a bill that would enable us to start using people as early as age 18 for a CDL. Um, I think there's doubt that that bill will pass before the end of the current legislative session, uh, but that is something that could open us up to workforce development programs so that students could go directly from high school um, into truck driving. Other comments on that? Did I hit your question? <laughs> About the regulations, it seems like the regulations are changing more restrictions on the truck drivers, you know, continually. Yeah, going, going back more than a decade, hours of service, you know, was the first step that took capacity out. And then, you know, in, in the interest of doing the right thing from a safety perspective, you know, ELDs came along and had the same effect of taking incremental capacity out. And sometimes we have unintended consequences. When they have these rest periods, what happens at you know five o'clock in the morning? You get a bunch of trucks leaving Memphis towards Nashville, and they arrive in Nashville right during the peak morning rush hour. And we know that the biggest predictor of crashes is the volume on the highway. The higher volume on the road, the more crashes you're going to have at any given time. So we had some unintended consequences. What we thought would be a good idea to provide more rest periods, but you know we have some things that didn't quite work out that way. I would just add the other consequences, lumpy demand, and that's why you see a lot of truck parking areas that add or over capacity and a lot of trucks on the ramps because hours of service says when your clock runs out, you, you can't do anything except park your truck. 
So truck drivers start looking for places to park overnight way before their hours run out, and so all of these parking places get very, very congested. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. TDOT is very concerned about this issue. It's, it's a real safety and uh, also deals with the issue of crime, too, with, with trucks parked alone on, on the side of the road. And uh, I know we've done some work with the guys from UT on looking at truck parking areas and how to optimize their location. I have a bit to add. <laughs> Just a quick one, outside of Export Tech, is we're connected with the various educational institutions. The Tennessee Centers for Applied Technology, many of them have CDL schools. They're all full. And so the demand is outpaced capacity and there's discussion of expanding the programs with the with the uh, applied technology centers as well. We got time for another question. If anybody's got one, anybody, final call. All right.